Hello everyone, hello Radelaide. I'm Sophie Brock and as Ben said, thank you. I'm a brand new consultant, like literally 10 minutes ago. Um, and I'm also still a PEM trainee. Um, I must make a few confessions first. This is my first Don't Forget the Bubbles presentation that I've ever, I've never been to this conference before. And this is my first presentation to an audience of this size. So please be kind. I've worn my garments fit in with you all. And I... <laughs> I may have taken a beta blocker to get through this, so those are the confessions all on the table straight away. Um, I, as I said, I'm a new ED consultant and a PEM trainee. I've taken a long and convoluted pathway through training across two continents, and I'm an NHS refugee, as the accent gives away. Um, I've had twins 11 years ago in training and another little one fairly recently. So I'm sure that there's lots of you who can identify with the challenges that that has um, posed over my training. Research also is really not my thing. So in the spirit of professionally growing up, I've grasped the bull by the horns and I'm gonna take you through my whistle stop tour of my top five pen papers. Um, and I'm literally gonna try and give you bite-sized nuggets of information to take away. I'm not promising that they're gonna be practice changing. Um, and, but please feel free to read those papers in your own time and crunch the numbers yourselves. And I should have clicked onto my, uh, my introduction slide. Okay, so on to my first paper. Are children with prolonged fever at higher risk of serious illness? And this is a prospective observational study. Now, we all see those perplexing presentations of children with fever greater than five days really pretty frequently, and we all find them a reasonable challenge, especially at the moment when every man and his dog seems to have influenza B. Um, so the authors here are posing the question whether or not there is an increased risk of serious bacterial illness in the children with fever greater than five days and those with the shorter duration of fever. And this is a prospective cohort study taken with 37,000 febrile children enrolled across 12 European emergency departments. And they're using the same sensible warning signs that we use here in Australia. And I found the stats were straightforward, robust and easy to understand. And they found that the incidence of serious bacterial illness in the fever group greater than five days was 8.4% as opposed to 5.7% in the group with a shorter duration of fever. And we're talking here about lower respiratory tract infections, UTIs, cellulitis, osteomyelitis. You'll all be relieved to know that the incidence of invasive bacterial infections, so your positive CSF and your bacteremia, was about 0.4% across both groups. And I want to mention here that fever greater than seven days and even 10 days didn't increase the probability of these children having an SBI. CRP, and please don't throw things at me here, was a useful side product in this study and that children with a CRP of less than 20 when they were worked up diagnostically with their fever of greater than five days was a good rule out of an SBI. And they found that children with an SBI had a mean CRP of 111 as opposed to 18 in children without an SBI. The authors remind us to examine our differential diagnosis more broadly in children with fever than greater than five days. And 61 children indeed had Kawasaki disease or something oncological, immunological or inflammatory. And I've got a pause for thought here at the end of this study. I wonder whether or not these results were really extrapolatable for Australia in our territory areas where we see malaria, dengue, and rheumatic fever. And I also wanted to point out that these children, however, having that higher incidence of SBI in the greater fever than five days, didn't have an increased risk of ICU admission or resuscitation. And leading on with our hordes of febrile children that we see daily, we also know that a lot of them are tachypneic and tachycardic. And our challenge as emergency doctors is to pick those with self-limiting viral from the ones who are at risk of serious illness. You'll all have seen the guidelines that look at observations. And what the authors here wish to do is to assess the diagnostic value of heart rate and respiratory rate for SBI in children after temperature lowering and administration of antipyretics has been given. This is a prospective study taken in London at the St. Mary's Imperial London um, Hospital over 12 months, enlisting children greater than a month to 16 years of age. They enlisted nearly 1,500 children and they had to have fever and one warning sign as per the NICE guidelines to be enlisted in the study. 
Tachycardia and tachypnea were um, defined by APLS threshold values and also age and temperature adjusted centile charts and relative difference in Z-score. SBI was defined by cultures, microbiology, virology, your radiology reports and an expert panel. The obvious weaknesses of this study is that it's a single centre study and also they excluded quite large population groups. So that was those triaged as red as per the Manchester triage category, so that would be a cat one in Australia, and then those that were non-UK residents, I presume because they would be lost to follow up. And lastly, those with multiple comorbidities were also excluded. The three take home points that I've got for you here today, if you're still listening, is that persistent tachypnea at repeat measurement in an afebrile child after antipyretics had a high specificity for pneumonia, but not other SBIs. And secondly, persistent tachycardia is not an independent predictor of SBI. It's a poor diagnostic test when used in isolation. And lastly, and I'm sure many of you agree with this, there is limited benefit in giving a really well-looking febrile child antipyretics when there's no red flags in the history or examination just to normalize the observations after the child defibrescence. On to my third paper. So pediatric sepsis, as you all know, is the leading cause of death globally in children under five. And we know that fluid resuscitation is the cornerstone of ED management and targeted antibiotic therapy. And you will have all read over the years the studies that have got us where we are today in sepsis, the surviving sepsis, the sepsis bundles. Um, and what I'm looking at principally here is the volumes of fluid given in the first hour in the emergency department. So the authors were looking at whether greater than or equal to 30 mils per kilo of bolus IV fluid given in the first hour, whether there was any statistical difference between giving less than 30 mils per kilo of fluid in that first hour. And they were looking principally at 30 day sepsis attributable mortality. They didn't look at things that we know are complications of excess crystalloids, such as abdominal compartment syndrome, disappointingly. So this is a retrospective study. It's not an RCT. And again, there's, I, oh, I need to mention here that the children were propensity matched. So they used the propensity score analysis to match the patients to limit co-founders, which is probably why this study actually gives us some strong and useful clinical outcomes. I think probably including children up to 17 from one month of age makes this a rather heterogeneous population. But this pre-morbid population in the study population with high potency of shock shows that there is no statistical difference in mortality rate. So those receiving more than or equal to 30 mils per kilo of fluid in that first hour had a 4.3% sepsis attributable mortality rate as opposed to the ones um, receiving less than 30 mils per kilo. So um, my take home point here is that maybe more is not better. And then I want to also give a nod to the RESPOND trial and other trials that are happening at the moment. This, that one's in southeast Queensland that I hope is going to give us more guided information as to when we start inotropes, because that's probably the next clinical question from this paper. Okay, bear with me here because I've included two papers, but one's a research letter. Um, and if you're not all over chronic traumatic encephalopathy as I was, um, I'd like to thank Charlotte Durant here, who's a former colleague and a friend for bringing this wonderful body of emerging evidence to my attention. CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is a neurogenerative, dis neurogenerative disorder. Um, there have been clinical diagnostic criteria proposed, but as of yet, it remains a post-mortem examination as do many neurodegenerative disorders. Um, so it's thought to encompass mood disorder, symptoms such as increased suicidal risk, um, and it gradually progresses to dementia. And sadly, they've proposed that up to 30% of children and young adults involved in amateur sports and professional sports that have mild repetitive head strike are at risk of developing chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And typically, it's been described in striking-based sports such as boxing, but actually, those sports such as rugby, soccer, and AFL are also at risk, and I would propose that probably domestic violence victims are at risk here. 
Um, there's so much we don't know about this topic. So I looked at the ASBB, and this is the Australian Sports Brain Bank, and this was um, brought about in 2018 to fund further research in this area. And they've managed to get 600 pledges from amateur and professional sports people for their brains, essentially, after death, to look at their neuropathology. And what this paper is, is looking at the completed first 21 donations. So really early days here. But what we do see is a clear snapshot of neurodegeneration in Australian sports people. Um, and that's pretty scary. So I think here we need to be thinking about our policymakers and us as clinicians as having a conversation about what we're going to do with regards to counselling parents, counselling children, counselling our athletes and going forward with providing and mitigating risk in this area. And then this one might be a bit controversial, um, but I wanted to look at the AFL, and some of you will have read in the press that they instigated a protocol in 2020 that increased the, re the rest time of their players after the sustaining concussion. Um, so this was an interesting paper because this data has been widely available to the public. So as I said, it was implemented in 2020, and they increased the time interval from concussion sustaining injury to going back to competitive sport from seven to 12 days. But what actually happened in 2020 is many players went straight back to sport without even missing a single day. And they need a medical clearance to do that. So something is different from the policy that they started here. Um, as I said, yeah, a high proportion going back without missing a single game. And this data stands in contrast to the ongoing improvements that have been made in the conservative management of concussion in the AFL from 2017 to 2019. The rationale for them making the policy is pretty clear, given everything we've just talked about with CTE, but why it's been so ineffectual from 2020 onwards is a bit unclear. Was it the bizarre year that was 2020 and everything that COVID-19 brought, or was it because the players had severe or non-severe concomitant injuries? Or was it because the number and severity of their concussion symptoms was deemed to be mild? But we know that we've moved away from that as diagnostic um, features in concussion, and we don't talk about severity of concussion anymore. So I think that that's a bit of a moot point. Um, we, I think there's gonna be an explosion. We're on the cusp of an explosion of evidence here for CTE, and that we're gonna to need to examine what we're saying to our parents in ED in, with our allied health professionals and our OTs and we need to dis examine more uh, concussion evidence and have that conversation with our families and um, whether or not we advocate for increased helmet wearing, mouth guards, more headgear, I'm not sure, I'd be really interested to pick your brains about this. And then I'm going to go on to my fifth and final paper which again could be rather controversial. Um, we're looking here at intersusception. So intersusception is quite a tricky diagnosis to make. Hey, they, children have a real severity of, um, sorry, spectrum of severity in their symptoms, and we know that ultrasound is first line in evaluating these kids. But it's been proposed that ED physicians are really well placed here to learn the skills of POCUS and intersusception, and to implement those skills to make the diagnosis quicker and thus. Um, mitigating that risk of mortality and um, morbidity and ED length of stay. So this meta-analysis systematic review that was published last year in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine pulls together 11 studies enrolling 2,400 children. 11.9% of them had intersusception and it looked at the accuracy of ED physicians making the diagnosis. And POCUS by an ED physician was shown to have a 94.9% sensitivity and a 99.1% specificity, limiting ED length of stay by 200 minutes, 200 minutes reducing ED length of stay by 200 minutes, and re reduction in door to reduction of the intersusception by 26 minutes. There are multiple flaws across these studies I'd like to bring to your attention, and that's principally because there was no single scanning protocol used and there was no single technique utilized by all the studies, but also within a single study, it looked like multiple techniques have been used and that perhaps even the scanning techniques have varied from clinician to clinician. It also wasn't clear whether they received didactic teaching or whether or not they were just learning on the job. I think 
for ED physicians to actually feel uh, confident in implementing this in their department, we'd have to have some prospective studies going forward looking at cost of care and patient outcomes and also agreeing on one single scanning protocol. Um, and then, of course, there would be all the questions around number of studies to be proficient, how many to be credentialed, how your department's set up for this. So I've really included this. As, this has actually been a, like going on for 10 years, these studies, and clearly it's not in my ED. I doubt it's in any of your EDs yet. And I do think that maybe some more studies could prove that we could implement this going forward. Well, thanks for listening, guys. And none of you appear to have fallen asleep, but I actually can't see any of you at the back. Um, and I've given you my take-home points here. Um, and that's the role of CRP in diagnostic workup in fever greater than five days. Um, and feel free to read a little bit more around that before you decide that you're going to utilize that in your clinical practice. And then that second study showed that greater than or equal to 30 mils per kilo of bolus fluid in that first hour in ED showed no statistical mortality benefit than giving less than 30 mils per kilo of fluid. Um, as I said, look out for the RESPOND trial results. Persistent tachypnea looks to be in an afebrile child on repeat measurement after giving antipyretics a really um, good strong predictor for the child having a pneumonia but not other SBIs. And finally, we're talking about repetitive head injury here, and I would love to pick some of your brains about what you're telling parents in the emergency department as we know more about CTE and the risks in our adolescents. And then intersusception, is it coming to an ED near you? I don't know. Um, but thank you for listening, everyone, and please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you.